All right, so in the interest of time, let's begin the webinar. Um, first and foremost, thank you to everyone who has logged on to join us today um, and take some time from your busy schedules, whether it's teaching or whatever it may be, we're really happy to have you here. Um, so joining you right now, you have myself, Dana Solomon. I am the uh, program coordinator for our teacher fellowships here at Earthwatch. Um, and then we also have Andy Zimmerman, um, who will be the presenter of this webinar. Um, Andy is a two-time teacher alumni. Um, he first fielded as a fellow, as a teacher fellow in 2016 on the expedition restoring Sierra Meadows, the source of California's water. And then returned again in 2018 uh, as a senior fellow this time um, on conserving wetlands and traditional agriculture in Mexico. Um, so today, Andy is here with us to present on the topic of empowering students to build resilient schools. Um, so, you know, just understanding climate change and how that can be brought to students and a more resilient environment. Um, I'll get into some personal experience that he has on this matter um, and also address approaches and resources that can support teachers who can then go back to their students uh, and support them with this. Uh, just a few quick notes on the Zoom software that we're using for the webinar before we begin. Um, you'll notice either at the top or bottom of your screen when you drag your mouse over it that there will be a little box titled Q&A. Um, and so that, the idea there is as questions come out throughout the presentation, if there's anything that you want Andy to get more into or anything that comes up, you can type those questions in there throughout. Um, we may have some time during the presentation when Andy will pause and we can address those, um, although we will also allow some time at the end um, to go back to any remaining questions. Um, so feel free to, to type them in there throughout. Uh, additionally, along that same toolbar, you should see a box that says chat, um, and you can use that for any technical issues you have, um, whether it's that you're having trouble hearing, whatever it might be, do let us know um, through that box, and you can address it um, specifically to myself as the Earthwatch um, participant, and I can help you there. Um, and additionally, we are recording this. Um, so. If you have any fellow teacher alumni or colleagues, whoever it might be, um, that wanted to be here today and couldn't, um, the good news is we will be posting this uh, following the, the webinar on our Earthwatch YouTube channel. And I'll be sharing those links so that you can watch it again or share it with anyone who might not be here at this time. Um, so with no further ado, I'm gonna hand it over now to Andy. Cool, hey everybody. Um, I'm just getting oriented to Zoom for the first time, so give me give me a second to get this right. Um, but thanks for thanks for joining today. I'm excited to share some stuff with you. Um, so, um, my name is Andy Zimmerman. I wasn't sure if you were going to be able to see my face, so here's two versions of my face. Um, I have been teaching science for six years in uh, public middle school in Brooklyn, New York. And over the last two, maybe maybe three years, I've really focused on on climate change um, in my not only in my classroom but in some of the uh, other opportunities that I've had. And specifically, I've worked uh, a lot a lot on the concept of climate change resilience and developing materials and programs focusing on this idea, which is uh, one of the big things I'm going to talk about today. Um, so. Dana already talked a little bit about which expeditions I went on, which saves me a little bit of time. But really what I wanted to say is that uh, one of the things I love so much about Earthwatch that really connects to what we're going to be talking about today is the, the, the idea that um, teachers can really be active agents in their communities to uh, help their school communities take steps forward to uh, solving environmental issues or even just uh, making people more aware about environmental issues, including climate change. Um, my, my 2016 expedition was explicitly related to climate change. My expedition this summer was not, but it was uh, about urbanization and the local 
wetlands and waterways, which is very relevant to me and my students in New York City. Um, so one of my big questions as an educator, which I think really ties strongly to what we're going to talk about today, but also my work with Earth, Earthwatch is just this idea of how, how can I empower my students to become change makers? Because I really feel like that's the truest um, expression of my goal as a teacher is to, is to move my stu students from not, not just learning about uh, science and climate change and all these things, but, but to give them the tools that they need and the confidence that they need to make some, make some changes happen in their own uh, communities. And, and in our case, it's gonna be within New York City. Uh, this slide is really dense and I don't wanna spend too much time on it, but just to give you some ideas of what I've been working on in the past couple of years, um, most of this work stems from stuff that I've done with my students in my classroom, but um, through some other opportunities and uh, that I've had, I've been able to um, develop some curriculum for schools in New York City affected by Hurricane Sandy, as well as um, writing an article about the work that I've been doing with climate action. And um, I've also brought my students to the UN to discuss these issues at a youth climate summit. And I've also worked with a bunch of, bunch of teachers uh, at, at both in New York City and outside of New York City to try to um, just provide some, some context and some resources for how to um, approach the concept of climate resilience in, in our schools. So that was a lot, but um, the main goals I have for this webinar are to basically just give you a bunch of tools and resources so that you, you can uh, start to think about how the idea of climate resilience might live in your school community and and how you can uh, engage students with it. So I'm going to provide some some examples of work that I've done with my students uh, as well as just a bunch of what I think are really really useful resources that that would help any kind of um, educational initiative to to engage kids with this. Um, this is a slide that I I've shown to every group that I've done any kind of professional training with just to sort of like a highlight the need uh, for um, climate change education in general, but also to just lay it out right in the beginning that um, that climate change is really like uh, a big issue that we should be thinking about. Um, so I'm not going to get super into this, but I just want everyone to be thinking about and seeing what the, what the evidence of climate change is, is and what the impacts that uh, we're going to face across the globe, what they are. So uh, you'll see observable evidence. These are things that are, that are observable today that scientists are well aware of, uh, consequences of, of our warming climate. And, and on the right side of that table, some of the risks associated with those, those climate change impacts. Um, so, what we're not going to talk about a ton in this webinar is, is how to teach kids about these things specifically, these scientific concepts, but more what can we do about it? And um, what can we do about it, I think, broadly falls into two categories. Um, there's mitigation, which means what can we do to lessen human contributions to those problems? Um, such as investing in renewable energy or uh, conserving energy, sustainability. Um, how can we lessen our contributions? Um, and then on the other side, there's how do we adapt to these, to these impacts and risks? How do we uh, plan for a future where climate change is present? So a couple examples. Uh, on the mitigative side, oops. On the mitigative side, a question that we might want to engage students with is how can we reduce carbon dioxide emissions in our city? And on the adaptive side, uh, adaptation side, it might be something like how can we manage the flooding in our local park associated with uh, sea level rise or increased precipitation? So this webinar is really going to focus on adaptation, which does have a lot of overlap with mitigation. Um, 
part of the sort of inspiration for a lot of the work that I've done is that I felt like um, a lot of climate change education out there really focuses on mitigation, focuses on what we can do to sort of lessen our contributions either as individuals or as businesses and governments to the, to the problem of climate change, but not as much curriculum is out there about uh, how, how do we understand the local impacts of climate change on us and how do we prepare for a future where those impacts are, are present. Um, so the idea of climate change resilience is, is the ability of a community to respond to and bounce back from the impacts of climate change, such as hurricanes, extreme heat events, and drought. So the idea of climate change resilience really starts with um, the impacts of climate change and, and uh, students learn climate change from, from those local impacts. So if our big question is how do we best engage students with understanding climate change, um, one approach and the approach that I'm going to sort of focus on today uh, leads us to an, another and, and I think a really good question, which is like, how, how can we empower students to um, build more resilient school communities? So not just understand climate change, but take action on it in our, in our local environments. So, um, what I'm going to do, the way that I've organized this webinar and all the resources is aligned to a framework that um, NOAA and the US Climate Resilience Toolkit uses uh, for local governments and small businesses and any, any, any group that's a, uh, sort of concerned with becoming more resilient. Um, this is the recommended sort of framework for uh, moving moving towards uh, a more resilient uh, community. And so the curriculum that I've built and the resources that I'm gonna share with you follow this framework. Um, and we're gonna, basically what I'm gonna do is just like explain what each, each of these steps in this framework uh, might look like by giving you some, some examples of the work that I've done with students. And then um, give you some, some tools that are linked in the slideshow um, for you to use if you wanted to uh, start doing this kind of work with your students. So I will provide the link to the slides at the end and in the speaker notes to every slide where there's a website or, or a resource or a Google Doc, there's a, there's a link that you can have access to at the end of the presentation. Um, so thinking about explore hazards, um, for me in my unique locality, the question that, that comes up in this part of the framework is how, how try to understand how climate change will impact New York City's future. So the next couple of resources are things that I show my students um, and engage my students with to, to sort of uh, give them a first uh, exposure to um, the impacts of climate change in New York City's future. One of the big things that I think is important for students to know for New York City is just uh, the effect that urbanization has had on the natural environment, which becomes really important when we start talking about uh, climate change impacts like sea level rise. Um, I also bring up some of the more recent um, extreme weather events that have happened in New York City, like Hurricane Sandy, which a lot of my students uh, can still remember in a few years they won't be able to remember it they'll be they'll have been too young but hurricane sandy um, is the type of extreme weather event that um, the ipcc predicts will will be happening a lot more uh, as climate change progresses so um, i always start with these two kind of big ideas of urbanization and i think i have a chat here which might mean a question. Got it. Oh, that's, that's a chat for you guys. Sorry for interrupting myself. Um, let me get back to that.
Okay, so basically uh, this whole approach for me uh, hinges on the idea that uh, one, one really strong approach to teaching climate change is to engage with very local, um, local data and, and engage with the local impacts of climate change first, basically asking the question of how will climate change impact our city or our town or our state uh, before, uh, as, as an entry point to learning about climate change. Because what's really uh, powerful about that is students can see these changes in their lifetime. So here are some of the New York City specific uh, climate change projections that, um, that kind of start the dialogue about the hazards that climate change will bring to our city. Um, a lot of the same things repeated from the IPCC report that, um, that I showed on the first, first couple slides, but specific to New York City uh, coming from, from local data. So the next two resources are two, um, two resources you could use to find data local to your region and, and potentially even city if you're in a big city where there is data on this kind of thing. Um, this one is states at risk. Uh, it's, it's very student friendly, but also very teacher friendly uh, for the same reasons. It's very accessible. And what it will do is for any state, it will break down what the, what the sort of most concerning climate change impacts, what they are, and link you to a lot of uh, useful uh, resources to, to learn more about them. Uh, I originally intended for you guys to, to be able to click on this what, during the webinar, and if you're savvy with the tech, you might leave full screen and check it out really quickly, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it because I want you to be able to look at it at the end. So statesatrisk.org uh, is a very good like entry point, high level resource for you to learn about what's going on at the state level. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So New York City, we've got uh, coastal flooding, um, more frequent Atlantic hurricanes, extreme heat is actually like sort of the number one uh, hazard in, in New York City in terms of uh, how many deaths are associated with that. Um, so one thing to do after, after we get off the, the webinar would be to go to this link and just and think about what the big risks and impacts are that your region is facing. Uh, if this sounds very gloomy, I wanna assure you that the next couple of, of parts of this are all about how do we get kids to move towards solutions and actions that, that make a positive impact. So hold tight for that. Um, another resource I really like is from the Climate Resilience Toolkit, which is also the, um, the creator of the framework that I'm using to present these ideas. Um, and it's called the Climate Explorer. It's really great because it will give you both historical data and projections. And, and the way that it's presented is very very accessible, very usable. You can also download the data from this website, but I think this is a really great resource to know about if you're teaching climate change, especially if you'd like to do it in a, in a place-based way that's connected to your local, uh, local area. So that's Climate Explorer and States at Risk, two really good ways to just sort of get a high level look at climate change impacts in your, in your region. Um, so, the next uh, step in the sort of process towards resilience is assess vulnerability and risks. And um, really the question for I think schools and, and school communities is what are the particular climate change impacts and risks that uh, face our school building and our surrounding community. So what I have for you is a couple resources that you might use um, to, to engage students with that question. Um, the first is a, an assessment that I developed um, for the curriculum I spoke about in the beginning, which is a New York City um, specific climate change curriculum that's focused on schools that were affected by Hurricane Sandy. So we developed an assessment for students to actually go through to identify some of the needs that their school building has in terms of 
uh, extreme weather events uh, and, and other impacts of climate change. So it helps the students to uh, take that first step of identifying what the vulnerabilities of their school might be. And that includes both physical vulnerabilities to, for example, if it's a coastal school, sea level rise, or, or for example, social vulnerability um, for um, neighborhoods that, because of the way that they're positioned, um, might, might be a little bit more vulnerable than others. Um, a couple other resources that might be useful to you. So this one would def absolutely need to be adapted to non-New York City schools, but it might give you an idea of how you can sort of put the, the onus on students to figure out how vulnerable your school and school community are and, and um, get them actually doing some of the work of assessing that. Uh, another couple of tools, and these tools are actually embedded in this assessment, is I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a te text messages on my computer and I'm not sure how to turn that off without like messing with the volume. I'll just try muting it. Um, these two resources are mapping tools, which I think is a really great way to uh, engage students with the impacts of climate change because it's very, very visual and very real to them and not so overwhelming as like looking at a spreadsheet of data. Uh, I teach middle school students. So this is like, these tools really help as an entry point to understanding climate change impacts. Um, so this is NOAA's sea level rise viewer. If you're in a coastal area, it's super, super uh, comprehensive tool to, to look at sea level rise, uh, as well as Climate Central Surging Seas, which has some of the same, it's the same sea level rise data, but also uh, figuring in some other important variables like social vulnerability population, ethnicity, income, that sort of thing. To so really figure out like, if we look at our school building and the surrounding communities, like what are the, the most oppressing climate change impacts? Uh, this is a, a linked resource. Um, so after exploring hazards with students, sort of that high level picture of what the, what the impacts of climate change are and then how they might affect our particular school community. Um, we want to start to move toward a, a solutions-based approach where students actually get to do something that can, can help to build resilience in their neighborhoods and in their cities. Uh, so investigating options is, is really asking the question of what can we do um, to make our school community more resilient? What kinds of steps can we take? Maybe that is uh, some sort of a public awareness within the community, or maybe it's redesigning some component of the school building or, or getting out of the school and participating in some sort of event that um, is a positive step toward resilience. Uh, in this step, it's really important to ground um, your, your students in the efforts that already exist in your city or town or state or neighborhood. Uh, and so this is just sharing the, the New York City happens to really have a, a pretty comprehensive uh, resilience plan. And one thing that I've tried to do when I, when I get students to take, take climate action or take resilience action, I guess you could call it, is to to make sure that we're aligned with some of the, the visions and initiatives within our city. So what I don't have is a good way of helping you find whether this exists for your uh, community, but I, there is one resource that might present some, some useful, useful stuff uh, that I'll show you in a little bit. Um, so now I'm gonna sort of transitioning transition into talking about a specific project that I did with students, which was um, surrounding this local park, which is near our school. Um, it's called Thomas Green Park. And as you can see from the picture, that's very vulnerable to flooding. It's also, if you look at the map or the aerial Google Maps picture, it's right next to a canal that is among the most polluted waterways in uh, the United States. It's called the Gowanus Canal. And this is a body of water that uh, is 
right in our school, near our school community. And it's absolutely vulnerable to things like sea level rise or flooding due to extreme precipitation. And so this park uh, is routinely and more frequently with climate change uh, flooded with potentially contaminated water from, from New York City's sewage system and our industrial waste. So it's a big environmental concern in our neighborhood. So we took this park as our sort of like site to think about uh, how we can build resilience in our community and how, how students can take action here. This is just a uh, FEMA flood zone map to kind of illustrate how close we are to that body of water and how this park, which is a place where, you know, our students go to the pool and go, go play and uh, go skateboarding and have picnics, like how, how immediately vulnerable they are to something like the sea level rise that um, that's projected to take place over the next hundred years. So, when we investigate options, we, we kind of look at some other models of what's being done to build resilience in other parts of New York City. Um, we're lucky to be in a city that has a lot of really, really interesting examples of um, landscape architecture and green infrastructure to look at. So um, this is just some photos of, of my students on, on some field visits we did to look at examples of more resilient designs that might inspire some plans that, that we could implement in this park. Um, so what this requires in order to, to do this as a teacher is like a lot of local, local information. Uh, one resource you could use to find, find out about uh, some of these things in your local region is, is sorry, I'm having trouble with the cursor. Um, there's a list of case studies on that climate, um, Resilience Toolkit website, um, and it's linked here, where you'll see uh, projects, student student engagement projects in in climate resilience from across the country. So I encourage you to uh, click that link and see what's being done. It's also it's also businesses. There's education, businesses, local governments, case studies about uh, efforts to make uh, more resilient communities from across the country. So the next um, step in the resilience framework is to prioritize and plan, which means going from learning about what's out there, learning about what the issues are and, and what kinds of solutions are there to really focusing on like, what can we do to translate these plans, uh, or sorry, translate these ideas into plans. Um, so how can we actually make a difference within our community? in dealing with um, climate change's impacts and becoming uh, more adaptive to them. So this is a sample from a project that I developed, uh, the project uh, that I developed to have students um, redesign this park. And what I had them do was uh, actually map out the park, what was there presently, and, and I created this um, rubric for them to, to basically uh, improve the resilience of this space. Uh, I divided into three categories, culture, ecology, and risk reduction, so that uh, they could sort of break, break down resilience into more manageable categories. Um, this is a, a student's uh, proposed redesign. A lot of it involves adding green space, adding green infrastructure strategies to the space to um, to make it absorb more of the stormwater um, and flooding that happens in the space. Um, I'm jumping, I'm actually moving quite fast because I had a few interactive pieces that um, are now not interactive because it was a little tricky with the webinar software. But um, so basically we had students um, redesign this local park and come up with a plan. They got feedback from landscape architects and then they built, uh, they built models, which you'll see in a second. This is a budget calculator I created for them to actually think about the feasibility of their projects. I've also linked that stuff below so that you can see some of the resources I used to do this project with students. Um, the last step, which I think is maybe the most important, is like once we, once we 
understand the risks that our community faces due to climate change and uh, investigate ways that we could uh, make a difference or change some things to make our communities more resilient. Uh, the goal is to, to actually do something about it and to, for students to actually go from learning about it or, or simulating taking action to actually making, making a difference. So what uh, I had my students do for this project was I actually brought them to a, a community meeting um, with the Gowanus Community Action Group, which is a uh, group that's a bunch of different organizations that meet to discuss this super polluted waterway, including, including the EPA and um, the local uh, Department of Environmental Protection, as well as different community groups and business owners who, whose spaces are right next to this waterway. So my students actually went to one of these meetings and we presented our plan for this park to the very people that will actually make decisions about this park's future. So this provided an opportunity for students to really like have their ideas um, reach decision makers uh, before decisions are made, which means that their ideas are going to be considered when, when these decisions are made, at least at some level. Um, this is one of my students actually presenting to one of our uh, uh, Congress, con Congresswoman, Nidia of Alaska's. And um, I just love this picture because it's, it's a perfectly authentic moment where um, one of my middle school students is, is just sort of, sort of like passionately explaining her design of this park. And she's being heard out by uh, the, the, the people who make, um, make laws and make decisions about these kinds of um, issues in our city. So I'm not going to read this whole slide, but it's it's sort of a summary of of what student lo, student led climate action might look like, and what the teacher role in that might be. And I I think that some of the resources that I've linked, even if I haven't had quite enough time to sort of explain each one and how they might be valuable to you, like I think they'll help um, help you in in thinking about what your role might be. In, in creating opportunities for students to lead these kinds of projects. A um, couple of questions to think about, and I, I realize I'm moving quite fast, uh, is which one of these resources might you be able to use in your classroom? And, and what can your students do to take action? How climate literate is your community? What steps can you take to empower students? to become the educators, to become the, the active agents uh, in terms of these issues? Uh, and how can you connect your school to local resilience initiatives? Um, one last resource I'm gonna share with you is sort of like uh, includes everything else. Uh, it's something that I developed for New York City teachers to, to go through these steps. It's an action plan uh, that includes links and just sort of scaffolds the process of maybe thinking about how you would uh, build some sort of uh, climate action project in your school or school community. And um, I'm sharing it with you because I think that while some of the resources might need to be swapped out with non-New York City examples, uh, it might really help to sort of frame, frame the process if this is something, uh, the type of work that you might be interested in. Um, this is just another set of resources on NOAA's website for you to check out. The links are on the slides. When I share you with the uh, Google Slideshow, you should be able to access all of these. Um, so I think we're leaving about 20 minutes, and I, I would love to actually spend as much of that time as anyone would like uh, answering any questions you might have about some of the resources I've shown or uh, what it means to teach climate change through the concept of resilience, uh, what that might look, might look like uh, where you live. So I would love to, um, would love to uh, have, have some time for Q&A. I wanna give you this, the link to the slides first. Um, so maybe if you have a pen and paper, copy down this link because all of the links I've talked about are accessible through the slides. 
I'm going to give you guys just a second to do that. So I will throw that up on the screen again, um, maybe after the Q&A, but I would love to hear any uh, questions or thoughts or things that I can clarify, resources you'd like to hear a little bit more about. We have a question for you here. I'll read them so, so I can see them and Andy, I'm not sure has access to that. So I'll read them and then Andy can go ahead and answer. So our first question is from Sarah. Um, she says, I'm helping develop a lesson plan on climate, climate change in our community. Can you recommend a hands-on activity for middle school students? Uh, absolutely. I think what I would recommend is definitely dependent on like what what the location what the locale you're in is and what the climate change impacts are because for me what i always try to start off with is like um engaging students with what they can see and what they've already experienced um so i guess my first question would be in order to answer that question like where are you um Uh, Quincy, Massachusetts, just south of Boston. Is that, I guess my main question is, is it a coastal place? Because I, I have a good activity for a coastal place that I'm happy to share. It says long coastline, major flooding earlier this year. Great. So in the short term, to introduce the idea, I have a, an activity in the curriculum that I developed that um, there's a lot of different hands-on. Um, there's a lot of sort of project-based stuff. Uh, but just as like a quick example of an activity, I like to, um, I think it's really important for students to visualize sea level rise uh, and, and also to visualize in terms of like actual uh, height, what um, certain levels, sea levels um, and storm surge uh, water levels would look like. So I have an activity where we actually use the school stair set in the, in the school to like model um, sea level rise and then what model what model what sea level rise would look like uh in addition to a storm surge like hurricane sandy so in the, in the activity that i that i do with students they uh, they create little cards that show different levels water levels uh and so like some of the kids will have the sea level rise predictions and they'll go and stand on a step on the staircase to visualize what the sea level rise projections are and then we'll take that and we'll take like um the the storm surge level from Hurricane Sandy and have the student add that on to future sea level rise projections so they can see like the magnitude of, of flooding that could potentially happen uh, in our coastal area. So that's like one example of a quick activity, but I would also say that the, the project that I, can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Um, so like I really try to get students to do longer form projects where they're designing something because I think it's a very powerful experience for us not to just like talk about these big gloomy problems, but actually to create something that presents uh, some kind of solution. So in this case, it's redesigning a particular area. Uh, students might also like um, uh, design, design other things too, like, like do a small scale project for, for a specific garden site at their school, or I have a lot of resources to help you think about uh, how you could sort of like turn it into a small scale action project. And those are actually linked on um, the last resource. Like you're going to find some stuff I didn't talk about in here in the, um, in the take action category that, that will help kind of like help you to think about projects you might be able to do in your school. All right, we have another question that's anonymous. Um, if you can just, I mean, it sounds like you work a lot with the students and yourself, um, but if you can talk about any other support that you've had with what you've been doing so far, if you have any recommendations on yeah. other people to use as resources. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that question because I, this is something that um, I was able to share with my uh, Earthwatch group and, and we had some really fruitful discussions about this. And I, and I think that like, so number one, I think projects like this really, really benefit from strong community partners, partnerships with community organizations. And so I, all of this work that I'm doing sort of stems from uh, a relationship that I've had with one organization called the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, which is the uh, the organization that sort of advocates for um, the cleanup of this canal that I talked about. And like, I think the thing that I talked about with my Earth, Earth Watch group is that like, um, there's really no like built in mechanism to being a teacher to forging those relationships, unless you're in like, uh, you're in a school community where that's already done for you. But I think like, uh, doing a little bit of research and figuring out like, who are the people in your community that care about the same issues and just like reaching out and forging those relationships will like naturally create some, some support because uh, from my experience, like people want to interact with kids and support educational initiatives. And so like, I would say like if it's a local, uh, the local parks department, or if it's like a local environmental agency or a small business that maybe has a particular concern, that's the same as yours or, of course, local government as well. Um, I'm, I feel fortunate to be in New York City because all of these things are like very readily available. But I also think that like uh, there's someone in every community that uh, that you could partner with to to strengthen your your sense of vision about what kinds of projects you could do with your students. I'm not sure if I if that's exactly what you meant by the question, but if if I can answer any other way, then let me know. We do have a little bit more time if there's anyone else that has an additional question. So I'll share what Sarah added. So thank you. I love the project design component, but I'm not working with students throughout the year. I'm a member of the city's climate action group and we are thrilled to be involved with lesson planning in this school system at all. We can't take on the longer term work, but hopefully as we develop relationships with the teachers, some of them will be interested in taking it farther. Great. Um, and I would just extend to Sarah that like, um, I'm also like a part of a climate resilience education uh, action group and, and like, uh, we have a lot of materials that are shareable with teachers that maybe some of them are New York City specific, but we're also trying to build things that can be shared in other locations. And I've actually spoken to a lot of teachers from Massachusetts about how, um, how, how well some of the resources that I use would translate over there because it's a, also a coastal place. Um, so I'm happy to share anything with you. And my email is on the first slide. So uh, make sure you have, let me put that up actually, maybe uh, so that people can get the link. Um, maybe we can email the participants the link to the slides as well. But I'm happy to share resources on anything that, that sounded interesting that I talked about. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I'll give it one more moment. If there are any additional questions, feel free to type them in. Um, otherwise, you know, if anything comes up later, if you're watching this recording and have some questions that come up, you can always send those questions to fellowshipawards at earthwatch.org um, and we'll be sure to get those uh, answered for you. Um, but otherwise, I want to take a moment and thank Andy for uh, putting together this presentation. Um, and just a couple additional notes. I did mention this is being recorded so that it's something that if you want to share it with anyone you think might be interested, I'll be sharing the link as well um, once it's set up a little bit later this week um, on the teacher alumni Facebook pages. Um, additionally, uh, just a shout out that the Teach Earth 2019 applications and Project Kindle applications are now open. Um, so please, please, please help us spread the word, get 
as many applications in as we can for another successful fielding season. Um, and if you want access to those links and aren't sure where to go, you can again email us at fellowshipawards at earthwatch.org. Um, and then lastly, the webinar series that we have been doing is still fairly new. So it's something that we're working on just getting to be as successful as possible. And with that, I'm going to be working on a poll that I'll be sending out to teachers and teacher alumni um, for EarthWatch to really get an idea of what time frames work best. I know we're all over the country, so just finding a time that that you'd be able to log in and join more of these webinars. Um, additionally, just to learn about some of the topics that you might want to hear about, um, whether it's something that we've touched on already and you want us to go into more detail or something entirely new. So um, that, and of course, if you're inspired and interested in presenting a webinar of your own, we would certainly like to know. Um, and so you can, similar to what Andy has done today, um, join us on a future, future webinar as a presenter. Um, so again, for that, fellowship awards at earthwatch.org. Let us know and we're, we're happy to work with you. Um, so with that, I think that's all the questions that we have. Andy, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to share, but thanks again for taking the time to be with us. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for, for signing on. Bye guys.